Welcome back to the show. And, uh, you know, since it's Monday, we're talking mortgages, we're talking real estate. And, uh, geez, if you just tuned in, we were talking a little bit of rain and the, the potential flooding uh, that it will well, inevitably go on in Seattle, in the Seattle area at some point in time, maybe not this year, but it will happen. Uh, Ryan Leopold does join us from Cobalt Mortgage with nearly a billion dollars in loans funded. Ryan, you know, it is interesting when people go buy a house in a floodplain. I mean, it, it, there's just different hoops to jump through. And when you say flooding in Seattle, is that what you're referencing? Not in the city, but you know, flooding in the area, oh, the okay. river's overrun. Don't you watch the news? Yeah, but I'm thinking, were you suggesting that Seattle's going to flood someday? No, not, not the actual city of okay. Seattle, but you know, the, you. the the the... the the Craven Farm Place, where I picked yeah. the pumpkin. But, you know, doesn't those areas pretty much flood like every 10 to 20 years anyways? I think they flood all the time. Yeah. It's I don't kinda, know. We're gonna have he's got to know the... going into it that's going to be the case, huh? Somebody's going to have to Google uh, how often. Yeah, you do. And But, yeah. you know, you get those floodplains on the on a re, on an appraisal, and, and you yeah. have to go through these extra hoops if people want to buy a house in a, sure. where it floods. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Sometimes yeah. it's worth it. Yeah. I, I get I it. I suppose if you really like to own sandbags and lift up all your, your stuff up four feet sometimes and i want to live in the water yeah you could live in it <laughs> like a duck I like uh it. so ryan you know there well as we talked about with uh if you do decide to buy a house where it may flood mm-hmm. um there are different hoops to jump through but there's actually more hoops to jump through just from in in the mortgage perspective total um than there were maybe four years ago five years ago six years ago and you know you had talked a little bit about the you know, people who maybe have chosen to buy a house that haven't gone through the process for five or six years and, and the frustration that mm. they sometimes have um talk a little bit about maybe the differences between you know five years ago six years ago and, and what people are going through now when they want to either buy or refinance their house sure and, and like you just mentioned that the whole lending environment is a way different than it was, let's just say, prior to 2007 and past 2007. It's just a lot more of a challenge to get a loan these days. Um, It's not actually not a challenge to get a loan. The process is a lot more challenging. So as long as you're structured and organized up front, it's going to make the make things a lot more smoother. But the biggest challenge I think we deal with on the mortgage side is a first time home buyer who's buying in this market and getting into the process of getting a mortgage have never gone through this process before. They're like, yeah, it's tough. There's a lot more. There's a lot of things that we need, but they're okay with doing it because they recognize that this is the process you have to go through to get a mortgage. The biggest challenge we face, where we're always kind of, I'd, I'd say, we're re-educating the public a little bit, are people who have actually bought homes before and who haven't gone through the mortgage process since 2007. So that's the biggest challenge we face every day is this re, kind of retraining buyers and if people are refinancing, just borrowers in general, kind of all the stuff we need, uh, the, independent on what their position is, whether you know they make millions of dollars a year or $50,000 a year, the process is the same pretty much for everybody. Okay. Well, you talk about things and, and stuff that people need. What are those? What do you, what do you mean by that? Okay, so you're going to have the basic stuff. So whether it's a, somebody's a first-time home buyer, move-up buyer, or he's going to need normal stuff like pay stubs, W two, so paperwork, tax documentation. Returns. Yeah, absolutely. What, what I was getting into is is the stuff that we need outside the ordinary is a lot more detailed today. And in my opinion, a good lender is going to collect everything they can up front and kind of per- proceed, see the problems that are going to pop up. Um, moving forward and actually collect everything up front to actually hopefully make everything a much smoother process for the buyer or somebody who's looking to refinance just a borrower trying to get a loan. Yeah, and I mean, doing and, and uh, the amount of paperwork, I think, as you were saying, with first time home buyers, they may say, okay, I have to give the lender a lot of paperwork. Mm-hmm. Five, six years ago, it may have been more like, I didn't have to give you anything five yeah. years ago. I got to sign my name and that was it. And now you have this huge discrepancy in what people think they should have to provide as far as documentation on like income and assets. Yeah, I like that word, what people think they should provide. Okay. So in, in the- You probably in, actually don't like that piece at all. <laughs> well, well oh, I, it's a really good term because that's the problem, especially if people have bought before is like, oh, we've never needed that before. And that doesn't seem logical. And that's ridiculous. And, and absolutely, the stuff that we need is- way outside the box sometimes and it doesn't make sense. But I think what most buyers need to recognize from the from the lending standpoint is every lender's the same. 
loans are all sold to the same place. So whether it's the big banks originating your loan, a mortgage banker, a, a loan broker, 95, in this market especially, 90 to 95% of all loans that are originated are originated by Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, and those are sold to those institutions being Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and VA or FHA. They're serviced by the big banks, whether it's Bank of America, Wells, or Chase. That's who services the loan, but the notes are sold to these big institutions. The other 5% is kind of what I'd say outside the box, and that's usually for like jumbo loans or really, really unique situations. But 95% of loans are all done the same. So every lender is going to ask for the same stuff. So whether it's upfront or later on in the process, you're going to need the stuff. So work with your lender, get everything they need upfront as much as possible. And you know, if you're working with a good lender, they should be organized and structured about how they present the list of documents they need up front. And so when you start talking about these loans being sold, mm-hmm. you know, it, I think it's really important to touch on it's not even necessarily the person that you're working with that wants to get wants you to go get more paperwork. Mm-hmm. I, if you didn't have to ask for more paperwork, it's not like that's the best <laughs> part of your job. Mm-hmm. Hey, man, you know, you have this deposit and now we need to source it. And you're like, it's a gift from my mom. Well, my mom doesn't have a bank account. And I mean, it's a it's a friggin mess. That's a good depiction. It, it of it, is. Yeah. And I don't think it's you that yeah. wants to put somebody through the ringer. But the issue is that when the loans get sold down the road, those people, those institutions want to know who that mom was and why she gave the person a thousand bucks. Yeah, so those institutions, and that's a really good point. So if all these loans are being sold to the Fannie, Fray, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHAs of the world, you have to, so from a from a bank, whether it be Bank of America or Wells Fargo or a mortgage banker, being like Cobalt, like I said, Cobalt, we originate the loan and sell it to Fannie and Freddie. That loan has to be absolutely perfect when it comes to those letters of explanation. Those, the file has to be perfect. The, everything about the file has to be absolutely perfect because there's a risk of a buyback that actually Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac could make that bank or those institutions buy back the loan if it's not perfect. So that puts a ton of pressure on us, which we don't like to do. That's, I mean, that's not the fun part of doing mortgages and helping people. It was much more fun when it was like, you know, hey, how much do you make? Okay, that's good. I think we're going to be fine. Perfect. That's it. You know, that, that was, granted, it didn't work very well for the long term, but right. that was, that's what people remember and the responsible yeah. people who could afford their homes. I mean, it wasn't the worst program for people like that. And, and really, that's what it was back in pre-2007 is it was very easy during that five to 10 year stretch that you could talk to anyone, whether they had bad credit, no job job, no money, they could they could qualify for financing. And that was actually a huge challenge because not only it created the issues we have today, but number two actually gave this false perception that getting a $500,000 loan with 5% down is an easy thing and that you don't need a lot of documentation. So I, I always wonder if people would have a harder time. We could even talk to the, uh, the you know the real estate agents uh, who are actually going to join us today. But if people would have a, 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 an easier time Handing over more documentation if you gave them a briefcase full of money that they got to see and touch and then hand over versus signing away just a bunch of debt, never actually seeing the money, realizing they're getting the house. If they could see that cash, mm-hmm. a, a brief, I mean, I don't know, half a million bucks. What's that? Probably three briefcases full of $100 bills. Yeah. My guess is that people be like, I totally understand. You're going to give me three briefcases full of $100 <laughs> bills. I'm going to go get page three of my bank statement. Why do you need an updated pay stub? This makes no sense. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Maybe we got it. Maybe we just have to materialize how much money people are getting because it seems like some there are a lot of people, a lot of mm-hmm. home buyers out there, and they think it's it's ludicrous. Yeah. Yeah, that I mean, that would help. Anything anything that would help to kind of give that visual of, of really the magnitude of what we're dealing with every single day that I, I think just make the process easier and the best advice I can always give for any buyer, whether it's a first time home buyer or someone who's bought multiple homes in the past, is work with uh, work with your lender, get everything you need up front. No, there's probably going to be some times throughout the process you're going to need to update your documentation. Just work with them. They don't want to collect it either, but it just really is part of the job right now. And the faster you can get that stuff and, and the quicker you can get it in, the, and the easier you make the process, uh, the better experience you're going to have when you go to look to buy a house. Yeah, and I think going into that process, knowing there's going to be a lot of paperwork uh, is, is half that battle and, and you know 
puts you that, the expectation is yeah, be set right. and that's the lender's lender's job is that set that expectation and work through the you know the requirements of what's needed and, and get the job done. Well, Ryan, uh, always good to have you here again. Ryan Leopold with Cobalt Mortgage. When we come back, you know we are going to go back into the real estate world and talk about some of the trends that are going on uh, even as we approach the holiday season. We'll be back after this break. 